So I'm going to switch over and talk about music, but there's a lot of overlap here. Music innately has structure as well. Any composer will tell you that uh, um, music innately has a kind of a structure. Uh, and if the structure of the music is AABA, then the structure of the lyrics better be, and vice versa. So it sort of depends on who goes first in that regard. Um, if the music is ABAB, then the lyricist is going to have to employ some different tools. Or if the lyricist hands over a lyric that is an ABAB, it's going to change the way the composer approaches the structure of the song. Music, interestingly enough, also rhymes, if you think about it. If you listen to music without lyrics, you sort of feel where the rhymes feel like they want to go. And if the rhymes in the lyric don't land in those places, it's not very satisfying. So it's really useful to understand where the rhymes and the music fall to make sure that they're the same in the music and the lyrics. So that means that the lyricist and the composer, whether that's one person or two, need to work in hand in hand. And a lot of this, you know, and, and there's no rule about whether the lyricist should go first or the composer should go first. Uh, many teams work differently. Uh, some people work differently from one project to the next. Sometimes they work differently from one song to the next. We will try to give you experience both ways because that's one of the things you could use this program for is to figure out which way works better for you or are you equally happy. Uh, but it's a good thing to figure, but you, could, you don't know until you try it the other way whether it's going to work for you or not. So music is also an extremely important tool in storytelling. Music has to participate in the book, the capital B book of the musical. Uh, it, the, sh the emotional shape of the music should really match the emotional shape of the lyrics and of the story that's being told in, in the song. So for example, if a character in a song is making a huge discovery by the time you get around to the third A, a big discovery that changes everything for them, the music shouldn't sound the same way it did in the other two A's. The music needs to notice that something new has happened. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to change the melody. You can stick with the, with the, a, a, the same melodic uh, material as the first two A's, but you have a lot of other tools open to you. There's rhythm, there's key, there's harmonization, there's accompaniment. There's many, many different things you can do to make the music notice that there's been a change, even if the melody stays the same. Same thing with underscore dialogue, uh, especially in development, and I get this, sometimes you know you write a two-bar vamp and just sort of stick it in and just say, keep playing that until they talk again. And that's fine as a placeholder. But in reality, the underscoring should also notice what's going on in the scene, and therefore the underscoring really needs to be tied very directly to the emotional arc and what's going on in the scene. So just repeating a two-bar vamp is not going to cut it um, after you get a, you know, further along in development. Um, now, really important thing for composers in core. You need to be able to notate. Uh, ideally, you need to be using fi Finale or Sibelius or possibly Dorico. Anybody have Dorico yet? I tried it one time. Yeah? It's okay. It's okay? <laughs> Gosh, I've heard such good things about it potentially, but I don't know anyone who's using it yet, it, so we'll it see. Be better. Yeah. It was, it, was, it was made by the people who were part of making Sibelius and didn't like some of the stuff that was happening with Sibelius and thought they could do their own thing. So we'll see. Time will tell. It's not really out there yet. Now, there are other um, notation softwares that you can use that are cheaper. Um, and and you know, if that's what you need to, that's fine. But, uh, but bear in mind that that means you might get frustrated. It might be hard for you to accomplish what you need to accomplish on a month-to-month -month basis for these assignments. And you're going to be spending, I think, way too much of your time on the technical part of getting it notated and not nearly enough time on the creative part of having it tell your story. So that's why we say, we say that you need to be able to notate to be a composer in this room. Now, if you're the kind of person that John Sparks always used to call a hummer, so you're someone who hears melody in your head like really strongly. When you write lyrics, you know what that melody is supposed to sound like. But you're either not able to get it notated on paper, or maybe you can notate the melodic line, but you're at a loss when it comes to putting in chords or harmonization or figuring out what the accompaniment should be and getting it into notation software. Now, um, if you're that kind of a person, uh, it, it, it's going to be a problem for you in this course. And um, you could ask your composer. Some people have asked me, can I, say to my, can I tell my composer I know what the tune should be? And can I hum it to them? And then they can do all that work of turning it into something. Uh, you can, but you do need to bear in mind that the composers who are taking this program are taking it because they want to compose music, not because they want to be your musical janitor and arrange your melody. So you can ask, but if they say no, you need to understand why. 
Uh, and also, once you sing your melody to them, even if you're just, even if you say, no, no, you don't need to use this melody, but I'm going to sing it to you so that you'll get a sense of it. As soon as you do that, remember what happened with, uh, with uh, There's a Place for Us. As soon as the lyric and the tune are put together, it's so hard to get them separate. And you, you might be shooting yourself in the foot in terms of the composer being able to come up with some, something glorious that you never would have thought of, but they can't because your melody is stuck in their head. It doesn't mean your melody isn't good, but it's not a good idea. Um, bear in mind that people who take someone's hummed melody and notate it and create an accompaniment and get it on paper, those people are called arrangers and they generally charge at least 200 bucks a song to do that because it is just, it's janitorial work. Um, as an example, John Sparks began uh, this program way back in the day when he was studying with Lehman. He started the program as a book writer and a lyricist and a composer. Um, and um, over the years, he said he discovered that although he was okay at writing music, he met so many composers who were so much better than him that he realized, why am I bothering? I remember this from one of the, I, I don't know how many of you have ever been to the um, Stephen Schwartz ASCAP workshops over the years, although it's not ASCAP anymore. Yes, it is ASCAP, but they, they went from Disney to DreamWorks to whatever, and they haven't had it during COVID. But um, somebody presented there once who had some of the funniest lyrics, brilliant, brilliant book, and some of the funniest lyrics I had ever heard. And they were set to just sort of serviceable music. It just sort of went um chuck, um chuck, um chuck, and it delivered what they needed for these hysterically funny lyrics to come out. And what the entire panel told him was, your music isn't, yes, you're writing the music and it's competent, it's, you know, it's serviceable, but your lyrics are so brilliant, you should have brilliant music. So you really should find yourself a composer. I hope he did. <laughs> I hope he went off and found himself a composer. Uh, one of the things you'll be learning in the Lyric Lab and putting into practice are Thing, you know, working on vocal ranges and what they mean in musical theater, harmonies, writing for duets, quartets, ensemble numbers, effective underscoring, all of that sort of thing. Uh, but we do it, we, so again, we encourage you to look, look at what's been done, like sometimes if you're trying to write a certain kind of song, it can be useful to go find someone else who did it really well that you like and listen to that and emulate it. We're not saying copy it, and we're not saying that you should try to sound like someone else. You need your own unique voice, but it can be a, a helpful pathway there to hear how someone else has done it. Uh, a really good example is, to me is David Yazbek. I think that he sounds, as a composer, different in every single show. If you go sit in one, from one show to the next to the next, you, you wouldn't come out of there if you hadn't seen the program thinking, oh, those were all written by the same composer. Uh, just a, a quick list of some of his shows, The Full Monty, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, The Band's Visit. Really, really different. But then again, we don't want you guys to sound like David Yazbek even any more than David Yazbek sounds like David Yazbek from one show to the next. You need to find your own unique voice, but you can certainly look to other people for examples. Uh, I want to uh, read you something that I, I, I came across. And some of you may have seen this on Facebook because it was very recent, but I think it's really cool. Um, and, I, and I'm only going to read you a little bit of it, and the whole text will be one of the handouts that you'll get tomorrow or tonight. This was a welcome address that was delivered by Carl Polnack, who's a pianist and director of music at Ithaca College, and he delivered this to the incoming freshmen at Boston Conservatory. I, it didn't say whether it was this year, but I think it was recent, if anything. And I think it's a, that, read the whole article, because I think if you've ever been in a position where you're trying to justify to your friends and family why you should be involved in something in which people burst into song because you know there are a lot of people out there still who think the whole thing is ludicrous and you know it's just nonsense but this this particular address is not specifically about musical theater but it's about music and the power of music and i think it's pretty stunning so i'm going to read a little bit of it the greeks said that music and astronomy were two sides of the same coin astronomy was seen as the study of relationships between observable permanent external objects and music was seen as the study of relationships between invisible, internal, hidden objects. Music has a way of finding the big, invisible, moving pieces inside our hearts and souls and helping us figure out the position of things inside us. Music allows us to move around those big, invisible pieces of ourselves and rearrange our insides so that we can express what we feel even when we can't talk about it. Can you imagine watching Indiana Jones or Superman or Star Wars with the dialogue but no music? What is it about the music swelling up at just the right moment in E.T. so that all the softies in the audience start crying at exactly the same moment? I guarantee you, if you showed the movie with the music stripped out, it wouldn't happen that way. 
Frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I expect you not only to master music, I expect you to save the planet. If there is a future wave of wellness on this planet, of harmony, of peace, of an end to war, of mutual understanding, of equality, of fairness, I don't expect it will come from a government, a military force, or a corporation. I no longer even expect it to come from the religions of the world, which together seem to have brought us as much war as they have peace. If there is a future of peace for humankind, if there is to be an understanding of how these invisible, internal things should fit together, I expect it will come from the artists, because that's what we do. The artists are the ones who might be able to help us with our internal, invisible lives. So, there you go, folks. I think that's why we have musicals. <laughs>